Hi, everybody. It is so awesome to see such a full house today. Um, thank you for coming. I see some familiar faces. I know there are shelter folks here. There are probably some rescue folks, obviously, and owners. So I'm just so glad that you're here, and thank you so much for coming. Um, I threw this really cute picture up on my title slide because I actually had one of my best friends. I have chihuahuas. I had one of my best friends send me that photo and say, this is so cute. You should put this up in your house. And while it is a very cute photo, all I see is a very scared dog. And so I thought it was just the perfect example of how the average person doesn't realize fearful body language. And um, we're going to cover all of that today, what to look for. Um, and by the end, if you didn't think this looked like a fearful dog, um, just looking at it right now, you will definitely think so and realize by the end. Um, so my name is Juliana. I work with Dog Latin Dog Training. We're a small company in mostly Northwest DC, lower um, Montgomery County, and we do pretty much all private training. So we've got one puppy class, but everything else is private in-home training to work on everything from basic manners to reactivity and aggression and some pretty severe fear. So I wanted to thank Maddie's Fund because that is uh, what is the, they're funding our videoing today so that we can video this presentation and get it out to the masses, which is going to be really, really helpful. So thank you to Maddie's Fund for making today's filming possible. And you guys will be able to reference back to this presentation, share it with your friends, share it with anybody who you think might be able to use it in the future, which is really, really exciting and very helpful. So. My experience with fearful dogs. So I've been a dog trainer for about five or six years now. I did it part time while I was working um, in a regular job, nine to five, for a couple years. Uh, before I started dog training, I fostered dogs. So these two guys over here on the side are some of my fosters, Baxter and Otis. They were very fearful, and I had no idea what I was doing. They were kind of back in the days when I thought love was was enough to quote unquote fix them, right? And it definitely wasn't. And I made a lot of mistakes with them and knowing what I know now, I'm a little bit horrified at some of the things I did with them. Just, um, I didn't realize the severity of their fear, but they kind of started off uh, my exposure to fearful dogs. I also have been deployed with the Humane Society of the United States for a um, cruelty case, kind of named, nicknamed 367, because it was a dog fighting bust, and they, over many properties, seized 367 dogs. And so I was deployed down there to work with them, and these dogs were so scared of people. Um, so we spent the first couple months in the shelter just helping them feel better around people and feeling more comfortable. And then um, I also helped them integrate, a couple of them integrate into homes, which is obviously very challenging because they were very nervous. Um, I also worked at the DC shelter. I've worked in three sh local shelters, but I was at the DC shelter on behalf of the behavior team. And so we, of course, saw many fearful dogs come through our doors, and we spent a lot of time doing behavior modification in shelter and then figuring out how to set those guys up for adoption into the home, finding the right home, um, helping that transition, that type of thing. Um, this in the top corner, this is Red over here. He's one of my clients. He's here representing my fearful private clients. Um, so in the last two years, I have done private training full time and I work with a ton of fearful dogs, everything from very scared puppies to Red, for example, is from Turks and Caicos. He's an island dog, so you can imagine Northwest DC has been pretty tough for him. Um, but I work with some pretty amazing humans, too, that help these guys feel better. And then down there in the corner is my own Chihuahua, Fiona. I'm the proud owner of two very nervous Chihuahuas, so I get to implement how to make them feel com more comfortable uh, day in and day out. So I realized as I started this presentation that it was really hard for me to actually put it together because I was trying to take what I've learned over the past six years and fit it into two hours. And not even two hours, an hour and a half, because I don't like making you guys sit here for two hours. Um, and I realized that that's just not possible. So um, I, I'm going to cover the basics today. I'm going to cover as much as I can without overwhelming you. I'm going to miss a lot of stuff. I just can't fit it in. I wish I could give you all the solutions to your problems today. But fear comes in so many different forms and looks so different. And so um, I do hope that you will find most of this helpful. But of course, your individual situation, your individual dog is going to be uh, very different than, um, is going to need a little bit more one-on-one -on -one help, obviously, than what I can give you in a two-hour presentation. And on that note, too, like Deborah said, please raise your hand asking about content. Uh, but I do ask any my dog questions or anything specific to your dog. I'll have time at the end for you to come up and ask me one-on-one. -on -one. So a lot of the 
presentations that I get to do for your dog's friend are really fun, easy, you know, how to tame your crazy adolescent. Um, fearful dog is a little bit of a heavier topic because as you guys probably know, living with them, it's not easy. Whether your dog is hiding, um, growling at people, reactive to dogs, biting people, there is a lot of emotional baggage that comes with owning a fearful dog, and that is totally okay. I do uh, pretty much, I feel like, just as much human therapy as I do dog training when I work with these one-on-one -on -one clients with fearful dogs. And I just want you guys to know, I mean, as you can see in this room, everybody here has some type of relationship with a fearful dog. You're not alone. There are a ton of great professionals out there. Um, and just being kind to yourself through this journey is going to be really, really important. All right, so let's jump right in. What creates a fearful dog? Um, a lot of times, you know, I worked in the shelter and a, an adult dog would come in acting very fearful. And the first thing is like, oh, we must have been abused. You know, there's, there's this sense that if an animal is fearful, it's only because of a bad experience. But there's actually quite a few factors that can go into creating a fearful dog. So the first one, genetics. I see enough eight-week-old puppies displaying fear severe fear um, of humans, novel objects, stuff like that, not just normal puppy timidness, to know that at that young age, that's a genetic component. So, you know, we always recommend that people meet parents if you're going to a breeder because personality is um, genetic and can be passed on. So it can be really important that if you're seeing severe fear in one of the parents that you're very likely to see that in the puppy as well. Um, stress of the mother can cause sensitivity in a, in a puppy, in a new dog. Um, some breeds, of course, are more prone to being fearful and nervous. So genetics play a very big role in fearful dogs. And that can be really hard because that really puts you at kind of an uphill battle when it comes to modifying the fear. Um, and then lack of proper socialization. So a dog socialization window is from a about eight weeks to 16 weeks. And that's a super important time in their life. That is when, basically, when they figure out how they feel about the world. And I say proper in there because a lot of people think that exposure is enough when it comes to socialization. And it's not. It has to be pop, um, positive exposure. When you simply expose your dog to stimuli, kids, trash trucks, skateboards, dogs, whatever it is that you're trying to squeeze in in that socialization window, if we do it in a way where we're not making sure it's great, happy, positive, wow, look at this kind of loud skateboard and look at it uh, predicting really good things for you, you run the risk of making it negative, and a negative experience during socialization is what can cause a lot of reactivity and aggression down the road. Um, and that being said, if you end up with a dog later in life who didn't get exposed to anything, positive or negative, that will also lead to major, um, that can lead to major fears down the road. It's also very interesting too, you know, we talked about genetics. I've met dogs with horrible socialization who have been exposed to nothing, who are super friendly and great and outgoing, right? That says that ge the genetics were really, really good. And I've seen dogs where the owners right off the bat have tried to do the, the right thing with socialization, feed it, you know, um, all that positive experiences, slow, controlled exposure, that type of thing, and the dog still develops fear. So it can go both directions. But proper socialization during that window is extremely important. And a lot of people will say with a, you know, an adult dog from a shelter or something, they're a little nervous. Oh, they just need socialization. Um, that's not technically the case. Yes, we need to get them good experiences, but you can't really undo bad socialization from that window, OK? So then obviously a bad experience too. That can definitely impact a dog's fear for the rest of its life. If your dog gets attacked by another dog, absolutely you can end up with a reactive dog where one experience made enough of an impact on the brain, which we're gonna talk about in a second, that it, was, it, had, it will show fear now that you have to undo and, and improve that association. So all of these things, sometimes when we end up with an older fearful dog, whether it's from a shelter or rehomed or whatever, we don't know what is causing the fear. But um, you know, a lot of people beat themselves up and say, I got him from a puppy, what did I do wrong, that type of thing. And a lot of times it's completely out of our control. So fear starts in the brain. This is so 
important for us to understand because when our dogs are having a fear response, it is their brain telling them that there is a major threat. Whether it's rational or not, that doesn't matter. Their brain is saying there's something wrong. So it starts with a um, sensory data, something they see, something they smell, something they feel, something happens. And their brain, their amygdala in their brain says, there is something wrong, so we need to activate fight or flight, which we're gonna talk about in a second. During fight or flight, we see an increase in hormones and chemicals. So that's where your adrenaline, cortisol, those stress-related hormones, those fight or flight related chemicals come into play. And those are regulated by the hypothalamus. So then the hippocampus and the amygdala work together to remember that for next time. So what you are seeing is a pathway in the brain that says this was something to be afraid of and we make, have to make sure that we're gonna be afraid of it again next time. And all of this stuff is happening in your brain while we're seeing the physical manifestation of it. And so what we're gonna talk about today is how to get all the way to the root of making sure that this sensory data is no longer something that triggers the amygdala, okay? So, fight, flight, or freeze. You guys have all heard this stuff. You probably have heard fight or flight. You might not have heard the freeze. There's also a fidget, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about. But fight, flight, or freeze are an animal's, or being's, three options when they are scared. Fight, I will do whatever I can to get this scary thing away from me, especially if I don't have a flight option. So this is where you see those dogs who, ugh, we get it all the time. My dog is great at the dog park or doggy daycare, but once they're on leash, they become reactive. This is because when an animal is on leash, their flight option is eliminated. So their fight kicks in. So you're gonna see that a lot. This is where we see the dog who is growling, 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 suddenly gets cornered and decides to bite because he has no flight option. So fight is what an animal will choose if he doesn't feel like he has flight a fight option flight option. And also some dogs, again, genetics are going to be just more, will go to fight sooner first, um, more often, and uh, it, it can depend on the dog. So we have flight. This means I'm going to move away from the scary thing. We love flight. We love when our animals and our fearful dogs choose to move away because that means that they're not fighting. And we really like to encourage and reinforce the decision to move away from something scary. Freeze, so this is the last one, and this is literally freezing in place, um, where it can happen for a number of reasons, but typically it's because I have no option, but I, my flight option is not there, my fight option is not there, so I'm going to freeze. We call it um, sometimes being shut down, meaning they're just so nervous that they're just sitting there enduring it. And unfortunately, being shut down, this freeze uh, response can oftentimes get misidentified as being calm or being fine when in fact the dog is not calm and the dog is not fine. They are just totally terrified they're not moving. Probably seeing a lot of whale eye, which we're gonna talk about in a second. So these are your animals, pretty much their, th their three options. And we can help them choose which option they're gonna do um, based on the choices that we give them and the way that we set up the environment, which we are going to spend this whole time talking about. Fight, flight, and freeze are um, obviously the cornerstones of figuring out how to work with a fearful dog. So going back really fast to what the brain does when the fear response, the fight or flight response is triggered. So again, the fight or flight response is related to your dog thinking that there is a major threat and they might have to activate really fast to, change, to f save their life. So we're gonna see physiological changes, pupils dilated, um, a heart rate quickening. I don't know if you guys have ever picked up a fearful dog, but you can usually d -d 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 feel their poor little heart going. Uh, their breathing will quicken, their blood pressure goes up, their hackles stand up. So that mohawk that they have on the back of their neck, that's a physiological response, piloerection. We can't, uh, they can't control that. Really good data to us if we see those hackles. Uh, their muscles tense. So again, their body's ready for action. So you're gonna see really tense muscles. Um, tension is a really, very interesting indicator, uh, helpful indicator of how your dog is feeling. And panting, so if your dog is uh, panting and it's not hot, then that's a really good indicator that something they're a little stressed about something. 
All of this is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. And that means, again, this is all stuff that their body is doing that they have no control over. So if we're seeing these physiological changes and this biology happening in their body, we know that something is going on inside their brain, okay? So here's a really great picture um, showing off the um, physiological changes that we just talked about. So unfortunately, guys, the pictures that I have are not going to look as crisp up here and the videos, which is such a bummer because body language can be such tiny little things to observe. But the great news is that since we are filming this, you could go back and reference it later. But let's talk about a couple things here. So look at these pupils. Huge, the whole side of her eye, right? And her body is very tense, which we can tell by these wrinkles back here. Her mouth is pulled all the way back and almost in a grimace. And her nose is very pink. These blood vessels here are all dilated. Um, her ears are flat back, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, again, flushed around her eye. This is a very stressed dog. This is not a happy dog. This is a very stressed dog whose body is telling her there's something to be worried about. Any questions about what we're looking at here? Does this kind of make sense? Okay. So that's the biological changes, the physiology of what, is, what the body is doing to prepare for a potential activation of life-saving behavior, okay? So I'm gonna really quickly run through body language of fear, and then we're gonna break it down a little bit more, but this is the classic stuff that you're gonna see from a dog who is scared. So whale eye. This is where, and actually she's showing a great one. This is where you can see the whites of their eyes because her head is forward, but she's looking out of the side of her eye. Um, mouth closed, so if we see that, again, that tension, that mouth tightly shut. Uh, body tense, so normally with a happy dog, you're going to see wiggles, you're going to see kind of relaxation, a nice soft face. With a scared or nervous dog, you're going to see much more tension. Tail tucked, this is a big one. This is going to be the one of the only things I think that is kind of helps us humans without knowing what to look for, realize that their dog is scared. A paw raise, so this is really important. This is an appeasing signal when their dog has when your dog has a paw raised, um, this means I am no threat, and I'm not sure what's going on, but I want to make sure you know that I am no threat. It's kind of like the white flag um, in dog world. So that paw raise, that tells, that they, tells us they're perceiving a threat. Uh, brow furrowed, so that really wrinkled brow, you can kind of tell that it's, the dog must be worried. Again, I think because you know, we have our eyebrows are so expressive, it's easy for us to see with dogs as well. Um, ears back, ears flat back. Again, she's showing that really well here. Uh, moving away from something. So obviously, if an animal is moving away from a stimuli or a trigger, they're not enjoying it. Now, we're also, we sometimes will see some offensive behavior when it comes to fear. Just because an animal is moving towards something doesn't mean that they're not scared. But generally, with a fearful dog, you will see them moving away. Um, avoiding eye contact. So eye contact is extremely threatening to, in the dog world, that direct eye contact. We teach our companion dogs to give us that nice soft eye contact, but typically dogs don't stare at each other in the face. And so especially with a nervous dog, you're going to see them averting their gaze a lot. And we're going to talk about human body language in a second, and you'll see how it's important for us to avert our gaze as well. Um, crouching, so making themselves small and not taking treats. So not eating is a huge indicator that our dogs are very, very scared because we just talked about all these physiological changes in the brain and that's all happen while that's all happening, our GI tract is shutting down and our body's saying, nope, we don't need energy for that right now. And so a lot of times you'll see an animal who's too scared not eating, similar to how when we're nervous, we don't have an appetite, right? So here's a quick picture uh, I'll point out some stuff that I'm seeing. Low tail, body crouched, head down, trying to look small. Uh, so this is a very, very nervous dog. Looks like probably making slow movements if we could see it moving. And I'm going to use a lot of pictures today and some video. For the most part, I have context on the videos. But photos are obviously just a, a picture in time. So I have no idea what's going on with this photo. But we can use it to study body language. But I can't necessarily say obviously what else is going on. And that's always something that's very important to remember when looking at photos is they're helpful for education, but 
not much, we can't predict much more than that. So this poor guy, um, we're seeing that this, uh, so this is a really good example of whale eye. Those brows are very expressive. There's a lot of tension, um, crouching down, obviously, mouth tightly shut, ears back. This guy is very, very nervous. So the canine ladder of aggression. This is where we're going to get a little bit more into breakdown, body language, what it means, and where it goes. So this is a really helpful visual to realize that dogs do not growl and bite out of nowhere. There's a lot of signals that they're giving us in the green and the yellow and even the orange that's saying I'm uncomfortable, but humans don't see it because humans are verbal communicators. We talk to each other and, hu and dogs are visual communicators. Everything is body language until the growl or the snarl or the bark. And at that point, you know, the damage is done and we've missed so many opportunities to intervene or um, help the situation. And so the canine ladder of aggression, it starts down here, super little stuff like yawning, blinking, and nose licking, which we're going to talk about in a second, to walking away, moving away. Um, and then you get into some stiffening and growling, snapping, biting. But there's a lot of steps, as you can see, from yawning, which is a stress signal, to going all the way up to biting. And we miss a lot of those signals. So. We're going to break it down even more. Some of this stuff that's in, in this slide is, was already talked about in the kind of classic body language of fear, which, by the way, your dog's friend has great handouts for the body language of fear, if you guys want to grab those on the way back. Um, but these are really important. So calming signals or stress signals, the, the term can be used interchangeably. Uh, stress signals just tell us that there's something going on, right? And Depending on the context, depending on the dog, they're not necessarily the end of the world. My dogs lip lick when I pick them up and squeeze them, um, but they're tolerating it, and I wouldn't let a stranger do that. But, so you always want to look at context, but these are really important to understand so that you can pay attention to them. And if you see them and you realize that the situation is not going well, you can intervene. So um, lip licking. This is literally when the dog's mouth is shut and they do little tongue flicks. And you'll see this a lot if you look at dog photos. It looks like the dog is licking their chops, you know, maybe eating a treat or something. But it's usually a little bit of a lip lick because they might be a little nervous about the camera. Or, you know, we're taking holiday photos and everybody's squeezing the dog and the dog's a little nervous. Yawning. This is a really helpful one because um, yawning is a way to dissipate tension and dissipate the stress that they're carrying. So we like when they yawn. And obviously, again, context specific, if they're waking up at 7.30 in the morning and they get out of bed and they yawn, they're probably tired. But typically, if you see it any other time besides when they're kind of sleeping, it's going to be stress related and not tired related. Um, shaking off when they're not wet. So again, it's like, whoa. And it's kind of this way to dissipate stress and dissipate tension. And we really like when dogs shake off because they're not holding on to that tension anymore. So this is, um, this will happen a lot, like maybe after you put your dog's harness on, if you step back, you'll realize that they shake it off because just there was a lot of holding and touching and um, we see it a lot after dog-dog interactions. So you're going to get that sniff, sniff, whatever happens, they walk away and they both shake off. Um, shaking off just tells us that they were holding tension for some reason, that whatever happened prior to that was a little tough and it's good data to us. Again, nothing here is necessarily like, oh my, oh my god, my dog, my dog yawned. Like, oh no, what, what do I do? He's so stressed. You know, it's just supposed to be good data to you, so that if you feel like there's something going on, maybe a child runs up and and hugs your dog, which hopefully was not permitted by you. It was, you know, just an accident, and your dog starts yawning and lip licking. It's like, okay, let's remedy the situation and get that child out of here, so I can help my dog from being too stressed. Um, so turning a head away. Again, you get that head turn. They don't want to make eye contact. They don't want to acknowledge you. And same thing, avoiding eye contact so they avert their eyes. That's all trying to be non-threatening, saying, OK, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to just look over here, because they want to be as non-threatening as possible. Um, panting, we already talked about. So if your dog is, if it's an environment, the temperature's fine, and there's no reason for them to be heated, and they're panting, there's probably something going on. Um, they pant a lot when they're in pain, and they pant a lot when they're stressed. I had somebody uh, message me because 
everybody likes to message me with their dog questions on social media. Um, and she said, I'm, I'm watching this dog. I'm, I'm babysitting this dog. And it's the first night she's here. And she's panting a lot. Like, is she hot? And I said, well, what's the temperature in the room? She's like, it's just normal. I said, OK, no, she's probably stressed because she's in a new place. So you always look at context. Um, blinking. So again, it's usually paired with looking away, turning their head, blinking. Again, trying to say that I'm no threat here. I don't know what's going on, but I'm, I'm, I'm nothing to worry about. Um, and uh, paw raise we already talked about. And then sniffing the ground. This is where we get a little bit of that fidget. So sniffing the ground if a dog is around something that they're a little scared of. It's called a displacement behavior. And it's kind of they're over here. It's like kind of how we pretend to be on our cell phones when we want to avoid something. They're like, OK, I see that dog over there. Oh, oh, hey, yeah, hi. You know, they're just pretending to be doing something else. And that, um, again, just good data to us. If you're, uh, I see it a lot with my clients during a training session. If the dog is not understanding what's going on, it's a little too hard for them. They'll check out and start sniffing because they're a little stressed about the training. So that's info for me as the dog trainer to say, OK, we need to give this dog some wins and make sure their stress levels decrease. So a lot of these things that you that are on this list, if we think about um, what happens if we scold our dog for like getting into the trash or something, and we see a lot of these things, and it's usually labeled the quote unquote guilty look, right? The paw raised, I'm so sorry, you know? They're actually not feeling guilty at all. They're simply responding to you uh, feeling a little scary. So they're, they're perceiving you as a potential threat, and they're trying to say, I don't know why you're so mad, but oh my goodness, I, I have nothing to be worried about. Um, so here is some good evidence of that. This is that yawn. We got the ears back a little bit, head kind of turned to the side. Yes, the dog perhaps was tired, but my better guess would be somebody's holding him. He's off the ground. There's a camera in his face, probably a little stressed. Um, and this guy, we see that whale eye. We see a little bit of that lip lick. Um, and we, he's also turning his head away. So all really good examples of, of these stress signals. And they're, again, just actively trying to communicate, I am not a threat. Okay, So this is very uh, the very lowest end of what our dogs are trying to say, hey, I'm a little uncomfortable right now. And that's really good information for us. So reactivity. I say reactivity. I basically mean our dogs are escalating in their messaging of OK, now I'm getting really uncomfortable. Uh, some of the stuff on here does fall under the label of aggression, but I'm just using reactivity as um, biting will be the next slide. But reactivity is more the, look, this is really not going well for me, and I need to make it louder to you. So the hard stare. We've talked a lot about averting eye contact. And that's our, a dog's way of saying, I'm no threat. But if they continue to feel that threat escalate or um, they are trying to get the space that they need, they might start making that hard eye contact. And you'll know it when you see it. It's kind of this look from a dog that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And there's a reason that it kind of sends us chills. So the hard stare is definitely an indicator that a dog is uncomfortable. Stiffening, going from kind of maybe moving around a little bit to an instant stiffen. And a good example of that is panting, 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 close their mouth. When, we, when I would do shelter evaluations, we had to touch their paw, and they'd be panting, 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 and we'd go right down their leg, and we'd touch their paw, and they'd, st and they'd close their mouth. We'd go, whoop, OK. <laughs> because usually what happens right after pant, 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 close mouth, I mean, a number of things could happen. But there's always a chance that they close their mouth in a, then to bite or aggress, and we just didn't want to risk that. They can also be closing their mouth to think about, whoa, that feels funny. What's going on? But of course, and when I'm trying to keep myself safe, I'm going to err on the side of caution. So a flag tail. So we've also talked a lot about tail being tucked. So if a tail is straight up, that means arousal. Um, it means that the dog is very, very intensely aroused about something. And a dog with a flagged tail, you see it straight up and going like this. Uh, that's an example of a wagging tail is not always a good thing. Unfortunately, I hear that so, so much that if their tail is wagging, then it must be fine. But when it's tie like that, arched over the back. That means arousal. And arousal is not the friendliest, always the friendliest behavior. Um, again, context specific. It's important to know your own dogs. Some dogs always get really aroused when they greet another dog, and it's always fine. But I certainly, if I'm having a dog greet an unknown dog and they get that flag tail and stiffen, I'm going to say, OK, we're getting out of here. 
Um, growling, obviously at that point they're saying, no, really, I need space. Um, snarling, lunging, barking. These are all the stuff that us as humans, as our verbal communicators, we're like, oh, wow, our dog's uncomfortable. You know, meanwhile, they've been giving us all of these symptoms, saying, no, really, I, I tried to tell you 10 minutes ago, you know, but you kept hugging me or you kept letting that kid be in my face, so now I'm escalating to this, okay? Now, obviously, all dogs are different, so some dogs tolerate a lot and spend a lot more time in that green zone, and some go straight to snapping. Um, but it is rare that a dog gives us zero other indicators that they are scared and nervous. And I understand, obviously, you guys are all here because you know your dogs are fearful, but my goal in telling you the green stuff, this stuff, is so that you can intervene faster and not let situations escalate when they don't need to. Hopefully they never need to. Okay, so this dog, look at those eyes. We're just looking just at the, at the eyes because I wanted to hide the, the, the teeth because it's a giveaway. But those eyes don't really make you feel very warm and fuzzy, do they? No, definitely not. <laughs> but I mean, it's like, you know, you see this, this face and this it kind of, woo, makes it, it just is a little, it's creepy. Um, also upset. Um, so we're seeing, again, the whale eye. The ears are not all the way forward. They're a little bit back. And of course, we're seeing the teeth there. So these are dogs that are actively trying to communicate, I need space now, OK? And it is so important that we listen to these indicators. You guys, if you come away with nothing else from this presentation, please do not punish your dog for growling, because this is your smoke detector. This is your dog saying, I am in big trouble, and if these signs go not listened to, I'm going to escalate. So if we get rid of our smoke detector, our house is burning down, OK? So I'm not saying let your dog growl at you all the time. We're going to talk about ways to help them feel better and address the growling. But we never, ever, ever want to say, hey, don't tell me you're uncomfortable, OK? It can be really hard, because it can feel like our dogs are talking back to us, or they're being mean to guests, or something like that. But try, I'm hoping that you're starting to realize that this behavior, this quote unquote bad behavior that we're seeing from our dogs is all coming from a place of, wow, I'm really, really uncomfortable. I'm scared. I'm nervous. I don't like this. Okay. So aggression, uh, these are, I put up here basically the bite scale. So Ian Dunbar is a huge, huge trainer in the dog world and he has a bite scale, level one to five. So a level one bite is an air snap. And that means that you don't make contact, but that's still on the bite scale because an air snap is very, that's your dog saying, this is a very clear warning, because dogs always know where their teeth are. And they, people will say, oh, I pulled my hand away too fast, so he couldn't bite me. No, no, no. These dogs are so fast, and they will bite you if they want to bite you. So if they don't bite you, that was very nice of them, because they intentionally didn't bite you. So your bites can get increasingly worse. So you have a bite that can touch skin but not break skin. You've got a bite who will, that will break skin and puncture, break and bruise. And then five is mauling and six is death, which I, did, which I did not put up there. Typically with fearful dogs, again, typically, you see a dog who might do a quick snap because all they want is space, right? So they're like, OK, you're really in my space, so I need to get this message across. Obviously, sometimes a dog will bite multiple times. But the point with any type of aggression is we, I need space, and I need it now. So again, we're listening to that. We're never punishing that, OK? Aggression from a fearful dog is not surprising. Unfortunately, human error can very easily accidentally trigger a dog to bite um, or dog to aggress. And you know, a lot of times we hear, "Oh, it was unprovoked." Um, you know, I was just hugging Fluffy, and Fluffy bit me out of nowhere. Well, Fluffy didn't like that because, unfortunately, human behavior is very opposite of dog behavior, not to mention opposite of fearful dog behavior. So these are just some photos I found on the web. The Sheba, for example, over here on the left, he's clearly upset and backed against something. So he seems to me, again, just a picture in time, he seems to be cornered to me. This other dog, this is a really good example of a flag tail. This is some more offensive aggression, but um, the kid is making direct eye contact and the kid is even there. So human error, having that child near that dog. Um, and then this last one, is um, somebody's holding their barking dog really tight, which again, we talked about fight or flight. We need to make sure that 
we're not making our dogs feel restricted and having to um, really escalate their fight because they don't have a flight option. So a lot of times, and for safety, of course, you need to hold your dog close, but sometimes people feel like they need to really choke up on their dog or keep him really close, and that can make everything worse. I would never, ever, ever walk towards a, a dog who's acting like that on a leash. Um, and I simply included this because that is the whole point of this presentation, is to educate you so you make better choices because the uneducated dog owner, Pete, you can have dogs for 30 years and still have no idea that a lip lick means that they're uncomfortable. And so it's really important that we educate ourselves as dog owners and dog lovers because it can be human error that causes something to escalate. And the poor dog is just saying, look, I was really scared and I tried to tell you, okay? All right, so we're gonna watch some videos. All the videos that I have today are going to be mute because I don't care what anything is, what is verbal is going on. What I need you guys to look at is the body language. So the first video that I have today is this really adorable internet sensation named Holly. And Holly is this cute little naked rescue dog. And she's come a very long way. And I put her Instagram handle up here because I think you would probably love her. And she's doing much better. I think she's been in her home for like two years. But her mom recently posted this saying, Holly's come a long way, but she sometimes is still very fearful. So we're just going to look. This is kind of the classic fearful dog that we see. Um, and so just let's just watch it and kind of see what we see. She's scared of her water bowl. So I'm just going to narrate what I'm seeing. Crouching, slow movements, tail tucked, startling. Moving away, slow movements. Okay. Crouching, tail tucked. Looking around, moving her head. Not certainly not moving towards the object. Ears are going back a little bit making herself small, creeping, very moving very slowly. And this ended up, I think it's going to play in a loop. This ended up, um, she said, I mean, obviously she drinks out of her water bowl every day. So her mom said, um, who knows why this fear showed up again. And that can be a really tough part about owning a fearful dog is sometimes their fears resurface and we have no idea why. I mean, why would you ever be afraid of the fear of the bull, right? But we just have to help her, our, our fearful dogs feel better about it. We, it might not be rational to us, but that doesn't matter. Um, I was gonna put a video of her also acting normal and looking very cute so you didn't feel quite so bad for her, but go to Instagram because it's totally worth it and totally adorable. So again, that's kind of the, that to the, Average human being, you would say, okay, that dog is very scared, right? So we're going to get a little harder. So this dog, just look at Nikki. She's a black dog. Um, and what I'll do is, I think these videos are pretty short, so what I'll do is I'll have you guys watch once, and then we'll watch it again, and I'll, and I'll narrate, okay? And sorry, it's hard to see with the with the light. I think the good stuff is over. I'm going to go ahead and restart it, and um, oh, no, it's not. And I will tell you what I'm seeing. Okay. So she approaches me. Unfortunately, what you guys can't see is her hackles are up right now. Tail is low. Tail is moving very fast. Whale eye, a lot of whale eye. Stiffening. Freezes there. Freezing again. Ears are back. She puts them up for the treat, but... So I'm starting to feed. Because basically, I didn't think she was going to. So now she's freezing a lot of whale eye, coming up for the food, but then. And do you see how tense her barks are? 
There's no wiggly, soft and fuzzy there. Um, so she's my close friend's dog, and we both are a bit mystified about her behavior because, again, she approaches and then gets just really tense and freezes. And her barks were also very scary barks. Um, she gets really in my face, not warm and fuzzy at all. There was no loose and wiggly about that. So even though she was approaching, she certainly was not comfortable. And that's the little tiny stuff that it's going to be really important that you guys start to read and understand because to the average, again, to the unknowing eye, this dog is approaching. She must be friendly. But that is far from the case. And again, I was pretty shocked by the. Um, OK, this is a very, very interesting video. This is a news anchor with a dog who was just rescued from a river. So this is pretty, a pretty well-known video in the dog training world because it's just so interesting with body language. Um, the woman does get bitten. So if you think that's going to upset you, go ahead and look away because it's a um, so like 20-second video. And we'll watch it once, and then we'll talk about it and watch it again, OK? Told ya. So um, how about you guys yell out what some just body language you were seeing? A lot of lip licking, absolutely. Where was the dog's head? Trying to move away, right? Absolutely cornered, totally. There was no fleeing option. And he tried to flee. He said, lady, I'm uncomfortable. What? Get your face out of my face, which also, if you learn nothing else besides don't punish the growl, do not put your, dog, your face in a, another dog's face ever. Maybe your own dog, but my goodness. So we're going to watch it again, and I'll narrate for you. OK. Lip licking, lip licking, blinking, too. Panting, lip licking. And his mouth goes panting, panting, close. Closes, panting, lip licking. I think this is where he tries to move away. Yep, he's trying to move away. Freeze, you'll see it. There, boom, yeah. He does bare his teeth, yeah. Um, so again, really interesting because to the unknowing eye, wow, that dog bit out of nowhere. Uh-uh, no way. And I do think the first time I saw that video a couple years, I mean, what, six years ago now, I wasn't expecting it. If I saw it now, I mean, I saw it from the beginning of the clip. Oh my God, get your face out of his face, you know? Um, so obviously, super. that dog was put in a horrible situation and that dog did nothing wrong. That dog said, Please get out of my face. Please get out of my face. Please get out of my face. My face. No, really, get out of my face. OK? So. Oh, totally. Yeah, there was a, there were, so the, um, the comment was the, the policemen were very intensely rubbing him. It was not a good situation for him. Um, OK, so now this is a super short clip of that uh, nervous pity girl from the beginning. So we're gonna, it's like 10 seconds, so we'll watch it twice, because there's a little lip lick at the end I want you guys to catch. So I'll be quiet the first time and then I'll narrate. Okay, so. Okay, so she's, we've got that nice low tail wag, rapid tail wag looking away, whale eye, t head down, and a little lip lick here. And you can see how dilated her pupils and how flushed her face is. So obviously very nervous. Now I like that her tail is low and wagging, that's certainly helpful. It's, it would be much different if it was high and wagging, but a low tail wag, yeah. But she looks like she's doing a little body shake too. Uh, the question was, or the comment was, it looked like she was doing a little body shake. Do you mean like shaking it off? Yeah, she definitely could have been. Oh, like a wiggling, like happy to see you. She certainly could have. Um, that's the really great thing about videos is if there's any question, we can go back and look at it again. Um, and we did a lot of videoing when I worked in the shelter because we would, body language happens so fast. And you, you say, whoa, 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 what was that? You know, we could go rewind and watch it again. Um, but yeah, so this girl is, my interpretation of her behavior is I'm not quite as, nervous about her um, because she is moving. I actually really like that, that side, head side to side. 
versus Nikki, who was more head right here and barking. Any movement I, I usually like, because it means that they're not stiffening and, and tensing. Great job, guys. All right, so now we're going to go into how to modify fear. I know you're probably like, that's great. I know my dog's fearful. Now what? So modifying fear. So we're going to talk about how to get to the root of the issue, not just addressing the symptoms. And something that's really important for you guys to remember is that comforting or feeding your fearful dog is not going to reinforce their fear. What that means is comforting or, or feeding your fearful dog is not going to make them more likely to be fearful next time. And that is so important to remember because if your dog is reacting or they are hiding or they are um, trembling next to you, they need you. They need you just like this little kid here needs her mom. She, you, they need you to say, it's okay, don't worry. You know? And for us to let them flounder in that moment is not, um, not going to be helpful. Yeah, there's a question. Great, so there was a comment that how you comfort your fearful dog is important, absolutely. Because if you're normally talking like this, and then when you were trying to comfort them, you talk like this and it's okay, don't worry, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. You're right, absolutely. You're gonna tip them off that there's something to worry about. I had a client once with a reactive dog and we're gonna talk all about mechanics and the importance of timing. And every time she would see a dog coming, her tone would do exactly that. She'd go, oh, oh, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? And sure, I was like, the dog, of course, like, mom, what, what are you doing? You know, so it absolutely, it's very important that, yes, we want to stay nice and neutral, um, reassuring. I probably wouldn't mo um, change much from what your normal behavior is, because again, that being, you being different, absolutely might stress them out as well. So really great comment. Thank you. Okay. So what our goal is going to be with changing uh, your dog's fearful behavior is to change the way that they feel about those triggers. So right now they see a trigger and they feel really scared about it and we want to work to help them feel really happy about it. So we're going to use a couple things in order to do that. Distance. So some of your dogs, maybe they're scared of the garbage truck. The garbage truck, if it whizzes right by, of course your dog is going to freak out. But hopefully there's going to be a distance where maybe a street over, two streets <coughs> over, they can perceive the garbage truck and not freak out. And we're going to talk about threshold, but it's going to be distance is going to be really important because a lot of times people will say, well, I tried to feed my dog around other dogs, but he just goes ballistic or he won't take the treats or something like that. And distance is a huge factor in this. If you're too close, it's going to be too hard. So we are going to be using a ton of food when modifying fear. Food and a fearful dog are like peanut butter and jelly. We need it to go together and it's going to be an integral part of changing their behavior. Because dogs are genetically designed to like food, and if they're eating the food, they can't be eating the food and feeling good about that and also feeling scared at the same time. Don't worry, we're going to talk about what happens if your dog's not eating. But you have to, if you have a fearful dog right now, just resign yourself to using a lot of food because it is necessary and it's going to get the fastest results. And it is, um, we're going to be using a scientific protocol with this, and it is really just a huge part of winning over a fearful dog. And we're also going to use choice. So this dog in this photo is not fearful, but it's a good setup where the person, the trigger, is not moving, is sitting, and the dog has choice to approach or move away, which we will talk about. But these are going to be three really important parts of working with your fearful dog. Because if you're trying to, from a distance, feed your dog while looking at dogs, and they feel totally panicked because they want to move away, and you're not giving them that choice, it's going to be ineffective. Or if you are trying to feed them and let them choose if they want to interact with something, but you're right on top of the scary thing and no distance, it's going to be ineffective. So these are all really important. So it's going to be also very important for you guys to understand that when your dog is scared, thinking is, I said limited here, thinking is not really happening. The only thinking that's happening is them uh, thinking about how to save their life. And it, it feels a lot like this. So. Truly, imagine if someone was breaking into your house and told you to recite in multiplication tables. And this is happening because all that brain stuff we talked about in the first slide, that is shutting down the thinking part of your brain. 
So a lot of you might have tried maybe asking your dog to sit when they're scared or asking your dog to even look at you when they're scared, respond to their name, anything like that. And that is going to be ineffective because if they're too scared, then that thinking side of their brain is shut off. Think about your thinking side and your emotional fearful side. If your emotional fearful side is activated, your thinking side cannot be. So that's going to be really important. And I basically tell you this so that you can manage your expectations. Because if your dog is having a fear response, they cannot think. They can't, um, they're not going to be able to probably respond to really anything that you say. Now, obviously, we're going to get them more comfortable. And the goal would be that in some proximity to the scary thing, perhaps we can ask them to sit, that type of thing. But it's going to take some work, and it's going to take getting them more comfortable. OK, so when working with a fearful dog, it's really important that you yourself are non-threatening. And so all the body language we talked about with dogs, we're going to try to actually um, mirror ourselves in order to make ourselves as non-threatening as possible to the dog we're working with. So your eyes are going to be averted. Your head is going to be turned away. Your shoulders are going to be relaxed and turned away. Your body, you're going to try to make it small. You're probably going to be crouching. Um, your voice, make sure that your voice is soft and quiet and in a positive tone. Obviously, a fearful dog probably won't do too well with, hey, Fluffy, what are you doing? Um, you're like, it's OK. You're fine. Give me a pop-up. Um, those happy tones. And obviously, screaming, yelling, carrying on around a scared dog is not going to go well either, and in fact, going to probably make them more scared. So make sure that you're using that nice, soft, calming voice. You know, it's OK. You're OK. Um, so that you're not scaring your dog any more than they need to be. And then your movements. Also try to avoid your, oh my god, guys, we got a fearful dog. You know, we want to make sure that we're being nice and calm and slow with our movements, no sudden movements, nothing like that, um, so that we, again, are not spooking them any more than we need to. So this is a still frame of me and Nikki. Um, so my eyes, this is my classic um, uh, pose with a fearful dog. And in fact, I find myself it's becoming like um, a reflex that if I feel threatened by a dog or, again, doing evaluations and stuff like that, if a dog looked at me the wrong way, I go, whoop, you know, because you just immediately break eye contact and try to make yourself small and non-threatening because that de-escalates the situation. So um, that was the way that I positioned myself with Nikki so that my eyes were facing away and my shoulders were not directly towards her. It's no secret that fearful dogs can be a lot um, more fearful of men because men typically are bigger and broader and boomier and louder and, you know, um, bigger movements and stuff like that versus women sometimes are naturally a little bit softer than that. And so that's why your dog might be a little bit more scared of men uh, than they are of women in addition to you know, facial hair and all that stuff. Um, but just because your dog is scared of guys doesn't mean that he's been beaten by a, a man before. It probably just means that men are a little bit um, not quite as naturally this and a little bit scarier to a fearful dog. So again, it's going to be really important that when you are working with your own fearful dog or any other fearful dog that you come in as non-threatening as possible. People are often very surprised when I walk into their house because A, I'm throwing food at their fearful dog, and B, I have this body language. So the dog warms up much, much faster than they would to the average person because the dog's like, wow, you're so safe. This is great. Um, because human body language, natural human body language is very threatening to dogs in general and especially fearful dogs. So we like to do this when we greet a dog. Hello. and we're bending over them. We're usually making direct eye contact. We're usually reaching for them. We are um, you know, talking at them. And so you can even see these, these dogs seem to be tolerating it just fine. But this guy's gaze is a little averted. And so that is the normal way that we greet a dog. But it can be very, very scary and, and very threatening to a dog. So again, instead, kind of crouch down, move yourself sideways, and be non-threatening. I found this picture of my colleague working with Red, our Turks and Caicos fearful pup. Um, and I just loved that she's working on targeting with him, touch. And she's even, she has pointed herself away from him versus again, which is fine for a quote unquote normal dog. You say touch, and you bend over a little bit, and you're right in their space. But for Red, it was too much, so she turned to the side and asked for it there.
which was very, very nice for her. So choice with your fearful dog is a must. And <clears throat> what that means is your dog is allowed to interact if they want to. They're allowed to move away if they want to. They are allowed to investigate if they want to. They're allowed to hide if they want to. Whatever they feel like doing or not doing, we should try to honor that as much as possible. And this does kind of go back to that fight or flight option, right? If we get, always give them that option to flight, we're going to see less fight. Um, I put this picture of a cat up here because um, we're realizing in sheltering how important it is for cats, for any animal really, but to have a way to remove themselves from the constant stimuli, right? And so cats especially need what are called hidey spots. And sometimes if a cat is really fearful, they spend a lot of time in their hidey spot because they want to be there. And it can sometimes be a battle in sheltering because, you know, the adoption staff is like, oh, well, you know, Fluffy stays in his box all the time so nobody can see him, so let's take the box out. But what that does is that eliminates Fluffy's choice. Now, if Fluffy has his box, then that means that Fluffy can go in there when he wants and he can come out when he wants. And if he's not coming out, there's a reason for that versus if he was in when he wanted, and when he does come out, he says, hello, I feel ready to be out here now. You know, it's kind of like an introvert. You know, we stay away a lot of the time, but when we do come out, it's probably because we want to and we feel recharged enough and we're ready. But if nobody gave us that option to stay away, then I would, it would be much worse when we came out. So choice is going to be really important. A lack of choice is very stressful. And it's important to note here, I'm not talking about choice in the sense of a rock in a hard place. I'm not talking about choice in the sense of um, sit here and be quiet or get corrected or um, you know, go interact with that person or stay two feet from them. You can pick between which one is worse. Um, I, choice is very important, full choice to remove yourself if you want to or interact, okay? So it's gonna be really important, the, a part of choice with one particular issue is strangers. So if you have a dog who's nervous around new people, and we've already talked about pairing food, we, um, the dogs are going to, people want to give their dog treats, have strangers give their dog treats, which is a great in theory, but what ends up happening is the dog approaches to get the treat, they take the treat, and then, oh shoot, they're right next to the really scary thing. So we really want our strangers to toss treats. We want to avoid creating conflict and having our dog approach because a couple of things happen. One, the stranger could sneeze or something or move their arm back and the dog gets freaked and bites. Um, or then the human says, oh, the dog's right here. It goes to reach that equation, right? So we want to do a lot of tossing of treats. Um, so here's a great video. This is that poor nervous pity girl who's been such a great example for us. And you're going to notice where we um, eliminate any force or pressure. The handler does a really good job. So you can just go ahead and watch. We're trying to get her into a kennel. So she stops for a second and she pancakes. She says, oh, I'm scared. So the handler immediately loosens up on the leash to avoid putting that pressure on. She's, oh, poor girl. Now, if we had kept the pressure on, you know, a lot of people like to um, say, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to stand here until you you put the pressure on. When our dog is too fearful, that's not good. We're, we're increasing their stress and their worry when they are, when we're forcing them to make a choice that they're clearly not comfortable with. So something that was really good there is the, the dog froze and instead of, again, putting that pressure on, uh, the handler loosened up on that pressure and the dog had choice to go where she wanted to. And she chose to sit and hang for a second until now you'll see. So we're just waiting her out. We're saying you can choose to come in if you want, or you take all the time you need. She wasn't eating food, poor girl. She was too stressed. Good girl. So she went very, and then we just get her stuff off. Um, you can see her, she's so cute. Sweet girl, very stressed. But she took that time at that threshold. She said, okay, I need to think about that for a second. Okay, and then chose to do it. But again, if we had put pressure on the leash, dragged her in there, anything like that, it would have been a really bad experience for her. So, we, you know, as much as we can, we like to have the luxury of time. Obviously, in a shelter environment, it's much harder to have that time 
all the time, a vet's office, um, kennel, that type of thing. You're not gonna have that luxury of time as much, but as much as we can, we really wanna give these, these dogs slow time to think about it. Okay, so it's gonna be really important that you figure out your dog's triggers. So just because your dog is afraid of dogs doesn't mean your dog is afraid to all of dogs, right? So sometimes it's uh, fluffy doodle dogs that are really wiggly. Um, a lot of times it's gonna be dogs that are staring and being creepy. Um, and I mean being creepy as in like hard stare, hackles up, high tail, you know, they might not be reacting, but they're talking a lot of smack from across the street. Um, your dog might be afraid of people, but it's not all the time. So it's gonna be really important that you get a precise list of what your dog is afraid of, because that's how you're gonna start the behavior modification process. If your dog is only afraid of workers who, you know, um, uh, delivery men who come to your house, but are fine with everybody else, then that's where you're gonna focus your behavior modification, right? So, and if your dog is afraid of, you know, big uh, German Shepherdy large dogs, you know, then that's gonna be more helpful for you to know how to modify that fear. And the next thing that you do is determine your dog's threshold. So we talked about that distance. So threshold is basically, what are the circumstances in which your dog can perceive the trigger but not yet react? So when your dog is under threshold, this is the desirable place to work. When they're in the green, they're feeling comfortable. They're relaxed, they're taking treats, they can respond to your cues. For some dogs, especially like a reactive dog, this might be a football field away. Threshold is gonna be really important um, that we're always working for this program to work, that we're working under threshold as much as possible and maybe sometimes working at threshold if we need to, but again, ideally under. So at, we're starting to lose them. They're snatching their treats. We're seeing an increase in that tension. We are, um, they're harder to break their focus. They might be staring, but, and you can kind of get them to look back. You haven't totally lost them. That's where you're teetering, right? And then of course, um, over threshold, you're getting that reactivity, barking, lunging. Maybe your dog is hiding. Maybe your dog is pancaked and panicked on the floor. Um, over threshold is a place where your dog cannot learn, cannot think, um, they're panicking. They're having that fear response. So that's why it's gonna be really important that we stay in this under threshold area for this program, for any type of modifying of fears to be effective. We're gonna talk about in a little bit what to, hap what to do if you're like, that's great, but my dog is scared of other dogs and it happens from three blocks away. Um, but, and we really wanna try to avoid our dogs going over threshold, okay? So uh, we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about something called counter conditioning, where basically your dog has a negative emotion association with a trigger, and we're gonna try to change that association. For, uh, and we're gonna pair that scary thing with food, praise, sometimes play, if your dog is really play motivated, or something really good. Um, this is different than obedience training. We've already talked about thinking can't happen when your dog is scared. Uh, we are just working to change the way that they feel, which can be so weird to wrap your head around because um, it's hard, it just can be hard for the average person to realize that our, our dog's uh, behavior is a product of their feelings, and so we have to help their feelings, uh, but it really is what we have to do. And so this is not at a treat after the sit, so you get the sit again next time. That's called operant conditioning. What we're doing is classical counter conditioning. That's what we're gonna try to do around the triggers, okay? So we're gonna talk a little bit about conditioned emotional responses. So this is, again, the way that your dog feels about something. So your dog might have a really positive CER to seeing the leash, because what does the leash predict? Going for a walk. Your dog might have a really negative CER to pulling the nail trimmers out, because what do the nail trimmers predict? A nail trim, right? And so this is the feelings that our dogs have attached to certain stimuli. Um, I have a really negative CER um, to traffic, duh. I think about traffic and it makes me feel viscerally bad. Um, I have a really positive CER to you know payday, duh, because it makes me feel really good when I think about it. So we're gonna try to create positive associations. What that means is we're undoing the bad associations they have and then creating positive ones. So it can be a kind of a tough job, but if you get, understand the concept, then we can start to apply it as much as we need to. So we are going to have the scary thing predict the good thing, okay? So what that looks like. 
I hate snakes. I hate them. And hopefully a couple of you too, do too, so that you can, you'll be able to relate to this example that I'm doing. But I really hate snakes. However, if every time I saw a snake in a controlled way that I knew it wasn't going to hurt me, um, money started being deposited into my bank account, <laughs> I'd start feeling a lot better about snakes. And we're going to talk about the mechanics in a second, but this is how we're going to change the emotional association, um, is we're going to have the scary uh, trash truck start to predict um, playtime, or we're going to have the people coming over predict squeeze cheese. Okay, so we're going to um, have the scary stuff predict the good stuff. But there's a lot of important factors to this. So the food value that you use, I have a $5 bill up here. A $5 bill would not work to try to get me to hate snakes less because I hate snakes too much. I would need a $100 bill, absolutely. So if you're trying to use Zooks or your dog's kibble or something like that, you probably need to increase the value a whole lot depending on the level of the fear, peanut butter, squeeze cheese, baby food, um, regular cheese, deli meat. You're going to need to bring out the big guns if your dog is super, super fearful. Um, this sequence is really important. If I started seeing money deposited in my bank account before the snake came out, I would actually hate money being deposited in my bank account because I knew what it was predicting. Um, so a lot of times an example is we have a reactive dog and we're working with it on the street and we start to fuss with our treats. Our dog says, oh shoot, I know what that means and they start looking for the dog. So the sequence is really important. So we don't want the good thing to come before the scary thing. Like if your dog, your dog might actually start to dislike if you go grab the peanut butter because you use peanut butter for baths. Because what do the peanut butter start to predict? Baths. Um, your dog might start disliking the car if the only place you ever go is the vet. So think about the sequence that this is happening. And it's going to be really important that the doorbell rings, ooh, who's there? And grab the food and get everything ready and start feeding versus trying to get everything ready first. Because then they're going to start realizing, wow, you're gathering up the treats. That must mean we're having people over. It's time for me to get really upset. And I don't like those treats either. Now, threshold, we just talked a whole bunch about threshold. If I'm already screaming, you've lost your opportunity. So if I'm already reacting to the snake, that's not a time to try to do training. The top thing that you need to do is get me away from that snake. Um, so that's going to be really important is realizing that you have to stay under threshold and that if your dog is already over threshold, you can try shoving food in their mouth. They might not take it. The best thing you can do is get them out of there. And that's a really important thing to remember is that if they're already reacting, feed them. That's OK, because remember, we need to get their emotional place better and calm down. And that's exactly what food can do. You do not have to worry about rewarding the behaviors attached to the fear, because we just spent an hour talking about how that fear is coming from they think there's a threat. And so if we start adding food to the equation, that threat's not going to be as scary anymore. And I promise, you'll know you have a dog that is barking because you rewarded it for barking when they go, woof, look back at you, woof, and look back at you. Not, woof, 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 you know, that's that emotional reaction. You do not have to worry about rewarding that. OK. Behavior medication. This can be a really important part of a behavior modification plan. Um, so we've talked about distance, and uh, we've talked about threshold and food. And behavior medication fills in the gaps for us where a dog is too fearful to even, um, you know, there's no circumstances around the trigger where they'll take food. Um, they fly off the handle from a half a mile away. We have no threshold. You absolutely should talk to your veterinarian about medication, or um, I should say anything that they might think might help medically. I cannot recommend that your dog be on medication. However, as a trainer who implements behavior modification, working with vets and vet behaviorists, it helps so much so many of my clients. Um, it is usually something that a client says, I wish I'd done it sooner. It's something that we typically like to see less of a reaction and a faster recovery from reaction. Um, and then, so the intensity of the trigger is not as strong. And so medication obviously gets a really bad rap, but it is such a necessary and important part of a lot of behavior modification plans. It's never intended to change personality. So that's never something that we would tolerate. We would never, we'd certainly, a, a veterinarian um, shouldn't, the goal would never be to 
<coughs> dope your dog up or make them loopy or anything like that with a re regular medication plan for behavior mod. Okay. So this is really important. There's absolutely no place for versives when it comes to working with a fearful dog. So choke collars, prong collars, shock collars, citronella collars, corrections, verbal corrections, physical corrections. There is no place for any of that when it comes to working with a fearful dog. And I hope you guys realize by now how important the association with that trigger is. Now, if I had, if I was scared of snakes and I screamed when I saw a snake and someone threw a shock collar on me and zapped me every time I screamed, yeah, I would stop screaming. But when I saw a snake, my panic response would be so much worse. Um, and what it does is it just worsens the problem overall, and yeah, you're definitely gonna see a decrease in the behavior attached to the emotion initially, because of course, it hurts to bark. They're not gonna bark, but um, it's going to worsen the problem. You're gonna worsen that association, and it's probably gonna worsen the quality of life for the dog. So no training collars, throwing bean bags, citronella collars, anything like that. It's just not worth it, um, and no professional that no certified professional that knows about working with fear will ever suggest it. Okay, so now I'm going to really quickly go over the practical application for stuff like this. And I'm going to cover a couple different categories. And I'm going to break it into two different parts. One is um, management. So basically what you can do to control the environment and control the people. And then the other thing is how to implement the counter conditioning, remembering that we're always working below threshold if possible. Okay? So management... Um, this is a really good example of management. This dog is wearing a calming cap. Don't worry quite as much about that. It just makes the stimuli less intense. He's a very nervous dog who works or who lives downtown, so his triggers are all the time and very intense. Um, not much distance you can get down on 14th Street. Um, but this do not pet leash can be very helpful because it does some of the talking for you in not letting people approach. So um, because a huge part of modifying your dog's fear is keeping them safe. So when it comes to strangers outside, if your dog is nervous about them, the first thing you have to do is know how to not let people approach them. Um, it is no one's right to your dog. It is totally your dog. And I know it might be a little bit weird and embarrassing sometimes to think about, um, to talk, say, please don't say hello to my dog, but you'll get better at it. You'll get used to it. Um, and then, so when it comes to the counter conditioning, pretty much any time your dog sees a person, you can go ahead and slip him some treats. Or if your person says, oh, he's so cute, you know, like, can I say hi? So, oh, actually, here's a treat. Can you toss it to him? You know, so we can start to make that good association, but we're not um, putting our dog into situations that they can't cope, okay? And again, you might think, well, my dog's already barking, screaming at people, so how would I ever do this? That's where threshold comes into play. You might have to do it from across the street. Um, maybe talk to your vet about figuring out a way to get that threshold a little bit shorter. This is a really good example of using your words and your actions to not let people approach your dog. So literally this. this is such a perfect photo example. No, you cannot pet my dog. He's nervous. Sorry. Not even sorry. So the question was, if I have a... There's a dog, if a dog seems okay around people but has other fears, maybe noises and some other things, and they seem okay around people, can we let them interact with people? So that's where figuring out your dog's triggers is going to be really important, making sure that you know what they're scared of. And then if you are going to venture out and see if they're going to maybe interact with some people or like, wow, I don't really know how they are around kids, let's see. You know, always paying, being very in tune to that body language and making sure that you're seeing how are they really feeling? Are they tolerating this? Are they a little shut down? Are they a little quiet? Or are they loose wiggly really enjoying this? Because you can follow your dog's lead on that as long as you feel like you're comfortable reading what they're saying. Because just because a dog is afraid of other dogs doesn't mean that they're afraid of people. And, if, you know, just because your dog is afraid of the garbage truck doesn't mean that they're afraid of dogs. So fears are totally independent to the dog. So guests in your home, so management, again, controlling the people in the environment. You're going to want to instruct your guests to ignore your dog and perhaps restrict access to that front door. So management is going to be a huge part of managing duh, that uh, front door greeting. That can be really hard for a lot of fearful dogs. Um, and then also give your dog an, a hidey spot. So if you are having people over, make sure that they've got a room or a crate where they can retreat to. That's totally off limits to everyone else. 
so that they know when they're ready, just like the cat in that hidey spot, they said, I've had enough, I'm gonna go recharge, and they have that place to go. Because if they're stuck out in a party or with people around and people start you know, really being invasive in their space and they have nowhere to go, you're gonna see a deterioration of behavior. Yeah? So what happens when your dog doesn't leave your side? So the question was, what do you do if you're, you have a Velcro dog that won't tolerate being somewhere else? So that absolutely can be a big part of this management practice is having to practice separation with your dog. So practice when there aren't guests around, putting your dog in a separate room or behind a gate or something like that. Because unfortunately, if you have a dog who isn't good at being alone, and then you try to put them behind a door when you have guests over, that can increase their panic, increase their stress. So that's definitely something, separation, that I would recommend practicing um, outside of when your guests come over. Uh, okay, so then counter conditioning, again, from a distance at which your dog can handle it, maybe not right at that front door threshold, get your dog nice far back, feed, just feed them treats as your um, guests come in from a nice far distance away, and then um, also, again, have your guests uh, toss treats to your dog. I don't, I meant, to, we tried to print these out for you. These are visitor guides for fearful dogs uh, that basically instruct your humans on how to interact. This was for a dog named Ash. I got you, um, we'll either send them digitally or have hard copies, if they'll be here um, at the end, and it has just a blank for your dog's name. But this can kind of help the pr take the pressure off you of having to instruct your guests everything, right? You can kind of, perfect, they're here, great. Um, you can kind of shove this in their face or have a family member give it to them while you're away feeding your dog so that you, they can read this stuff and educate themselves and you don't have to go through the whole spiel necessarily while trying to feed your dog and manage everything. But this can be really helpful. Um, typing up your own version, emailing it to people first. I have clients who, who do send their dogs um, or send their family members this document ahead of time because it just helps. So um, here's a quick video of me trying to build my relationship with Nikki. Just don't pay attention to what Nikki's doing. You can just see what I'm doing, and I'll narrate a little bit. So again, we already decided she was not comfortable, right? So she's approaching. I am not reaching for her. I am not soliciting attention. That was not a friendly jump up. So I'm going to get food. I'm tossing the food. So I'm, I like to make dogs give themselves distance, so I toss it really far away. I do have her kind of sniff what's in my hand and then toss it away. And I'm talking to Kimmy, that's why, I t or her, I'm talking to her owner, which is why I took the volume out. So then I move away, I turn my body away again. I think she was barking in the corner, talking to her a little bit. Again, not reaching for her, averting my eyes. She's sniffing my treats. Slowly reaching for my treats. You'll notice no sudden movements, nothing like that. There we go. So that's kind of the best way to win over a fearful dog. It's gonna take much, a lot of time. Nikki certainly was not okay with me after that, but in general, staying low, quiet, tossing a lot of food, and, and going at the dog's pace. Okay, novel objects, so you have a dog who's scared of something novel. So for example, Holly that we looked at at the beginning, if she had, um, if we had added a little bit of food to that equation, I think she probably would have warmed up a little bit faster. Uh, so restrict access to the scary thing when you can't train. You don't want your dog to spend all day barking at, um, I don't know, a weird balloon that you have in your house and then, you know, stress levels have elevated and it's gonna be much harder to react or to undo that. But you can practice, you know, just feed them for looking at it, feed them for investigating, um, toss treats away from it so that they can choose to come back. Just making it a really fun, no pressure, no problem thing. <coughs> and never forcing interaction. Remember choice. We came back, we already talked about how choice is important. We're never going to force interaction with a novel object. There's no dragging on leash. There's no saying it's just a doll or whatever, you know, in your dog's face because that's certainly going to make everything worse. So there was a really great question about noises. Um, so we, the, uh, the way that you would handle a noise, you still have to figure out a threshold in which that you're 
dog can tolerate the noise without reacting, right? So what I would recommend for specific noises is actually either recording them on your phone or finding a YouTube video and playing it at a really low volume or have your dog all the way across the house from the vacuum cleaner, the hair dryer, something like that. Feed, feed, feed. And once they look nice and relaxed at that level, may go put it up a little bit more. Um, but you, of course, want to avoid that maximum uh, intensity. And so just think of it as like the distance from something, uh, an object, but just the volume level being the threshold. Um, but yeah, I mean, city sounds, you can find a lot of stuff on YouTube and just start it at a low volume that they can tolerate and work up. Yeah. So we had a question, if, my, if a dog is on high alert on a walk, is that indication of fear? Um, alertness, absolutely, I think is an indicator that your dog is worried about something. So it can, but again, you want to look at context. It could be squirrels. It could be um, their stuff that they're interested. You want to look at what happens if they do finally see something. Do they bark, growl, lunge at it? Do they stare at it? Do they chase it? It would have to be context specific. We could talk more after if you want. Uh, okay, so other dogs. Uh, I could, uh, there are full workshops on reactive dogs and full classes on reactive dogs, and I could talk for hours on reactive dogs. This is the very simplified version of how to work with a fearful dog. And just because your dog isn't barking, obviously, doesn't mean that they're not scared. You can obviously have the tail tucked, shutting down around dogs as well. But again, the same concept applies. Anytime your dog sees a dog, slip him a little treat until the dog is out of sight. Um, Always keeping in mind your mechanics, making sure that your hands are not going to your treats as your dog needs to see the dog first. And then you're, they're walking, walking, walking. You see the dog, but you're not moving yet. And you see their ears prick, they go, ooh, dog. And that's when you start feeding. And if, <laughs> there was a question about dogs on TV. Um, again, you can go based on your own dog's reaction. Are they reacting to it? Do they seem alert? Are they, what's that body? language, are their ears pricked, are they looking at it, um, you, that'll tell you if they're responding to it. And if they are responding to it, you can certainly use it as an opportunity for counter conditioning. Um, it's going to be really important that you don't force your dog to greet on leash. We already talked about fight or flight. Uh, on leash greetings can be very, very hard for dogs. So again, if you have an adult dog or even a puppy, but an adult dog who you're hoping to quote unquote socialize, that's not an effective way to do it because that on leash greeting can be really hard and scary. And we want to, uh, we don't want to force them into those situations if they're already a little bit nervous. So avoid on leash greetings. Just start pairing that food with dogs as you pass by. Children, this is a really tricky one. Hopefully it's not the children in your home because that's going to be much harder for you than uh, children on the street, stuff like that. But again, huge part of it. Do not let children run up to your dog. In fact, even if you had the most stable dog, I do not want children running up to your dog. Um, and uh, making sure that your dog is not just tolerating any interactions if you do think they're okay with kids. Uh, again, we're going to look for any stiffening, lip licking, not moving. If your dog truly goes up wiggly, oh my god, I love kids, this is great. That's great. But uh, if you, there's any question, I mean, kids and dogs, the, the stakes are just too high. So again, you see a, you're sitting in a park very nice and far away. Your dog can look at the kids. You see them running and screaming. Your dog's kind of like, wow, they're being really loud. Feed, 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 OK? So in a shelter or kennel environment, um, I skipped the words here. I'm just going to show you how we counter condition in a kennel. Again, pairing my presence with food. This adorable sweet shepherd um, was very, very nervous. And I unfortunately didn't get video of him reacting. But I'm just approaching, feeding, and walking the other direction. <laughs> One more time. And we've been doing it for a while. Normally, I'd kind of bend down and toss it under so that they don't have to come up. But he was starting to warm up. But again, my presence predicts food. My presence predicts food. That's it. No pressure. I wasn't sitting there bending over, ooh, pop, 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 because that's not even going to be very effective for a fearful dog. That's way too much pressure to interact. So I just gently walk up, feed, and walk away. So this, he started to give me a teeny tiny baby positive CER. Remember that conditioned emotional response, meaning when I walked up, he started to get a little bit um, happy. 
and it's t very baby. I want you guys to look at his hind end because it's just a little tiny wag of his tail. Um, and he only does it the first time. I stuck around to see if he'd do it again, and he didn't. But it's only this one little wa wave of his tail as I approach. You can see that little wag. I know, sweet boy. Um, so I backed up and saw if he, he would do it again. I think he got nervous about the camera, to, which is completely normal. Um, but that is that positive association that you're looking for because he knows, yay, she's coming up to my kennel again. That means I'm getting cheese. And that's what we need because if I had just approached his kennel, first time I approached his kennel, he was barking and really reacting. He did not want me near his kennel because he was too scared. But when I started approaching and pairing food with it, he said, okay, yeah, sure, come on back. Come on, you know? And that's exactly what we want. So it's really important that we meet fearful dogs where they are. We unfortunately, well, unfortunately, we have to go at their pace. We cannot quicken the fearful dog. Um, we can't re quicken their recovery. We can't make them become less scared faster uh, just because we want them to. Um, this is Red again. That's him a little bit shut down and a little nervous, but his owners have worked so hard and he does have really great moments of happiness and um, feeling confident and comfortable in the city, even though he's still a really nervous guy. So this is just a really nice, um, you know, seeing kind of the two sides that he's a little shut down and nervous here. And uh, there he is, very confident and happy. And so it's really important that we do try to work with our fearful dogs, come with empathy and see them uh, what they need from us. Yeah. <laughs> the question was, is that one on the right a dog smile? Um, I would definitely say we've got a nice soft gaze. We've got really relaxed face. Um, that wasn't even him panting. That was yes, truly. This is about as ra relaxed as he can get. So I think yes, I would consider it the dog equivalent of a smile, definitely. So it's going to be very important that you work with a professional. Um, if you seek help, you know, or, or you're trying to do it yourself and it's not working, which is probably going to be the case depending on how fearful your dog is, working with a professional is going to be really important. Uh, veterinary behaviorists, we're so lucky to have a bunch in the area. Dr. Pike, Dr. Sin, and Dr. Reich. And most places you have to drive three or four hours to get one. So these women are all really incredible professionals. They are... Um, boarded in behavior and vets so it's kind of you can ask your regular veterinarian though they're not typically versed in behavior or behavior medication it's kind of like asking your primary doctor about um, stuff that you should be seeing a psychiatrist about um, and then a certified dog trainer perfect what's the topic great so dr sin is a vet behaviorist deborah just said she's going to be here in two weeks so um, that's a really great, she's a wealth of knowledge. She's absolutely wonderful. Um, a certified dog trainer, making sure that you are going with somebody who does know how to work with fear, just because you know how to teach behaviors doesn't necessarily know you understand how to work with fear. So making sure that they're comfortable with fear and aggression, reactivity, that type of thing. Um, CPDT, KPA, CTP, and CBCC. Do not go with anyone that is not certified. Um, it's just not worth it because experience does not mean that it's going to be good experience. Your dog's friend has a really great um, page on their website, and they will send you, depending on where you live, what trainers, what really good trainers are in your area. Are you saying that you can have someone with all of those? Any of these. And what yeah. Are you uh, certified professional dog trainer knowledge assessed is the first one. Karen Pryor Academy certified training partner is the second one. Um, and then Certified Behavior Consultant K9 is the third one, all from three different governing bodies. Unfortunately, dog training is an unregulated industry, so we, um, that's why you just want to go with one of these certifications, because it's the, the organizations that really vet their certifications, that type of thing. Um, fearfuldogs.com is a fantastic website, and she also has a Facebook page, wealth of knowledge, especially the Facebook page. It's nice to connect with other fearful dog owners. Uh, okay, so takeaways. Try your best to learn canine body language. There's a lot of great resources on the Your Dog's Friend website, here the, in the paper handouts. Prioritize choice with your fearful dog. Make sure that they have flight options. Make sure that they can choose to interact if they want to and that they're never being forced. Pair scary triggers with food, praise, and play so that they start to realize they're not anything to be worried about and they're actually really 
we want, they like being around the scary thing. Meet your dog where they are. Unfortunately, they might not make progress as fast as you want them to, and that's totally okay. They need you to support them um, and work with a certified professional, whether that's a veterinary behaviorist or a dog trainer or both. Um, and then just one last thing. Your fearful dog is not trying to give you trouble. They're trying to tell you that they're in trouble. Uh, that's me and my Lola. So uh, it's just I hope that this presentation gives you some empathy for what your fearful dog is going through and a full understanding of really what they need. So um, I'm not going to make you guys sit through questions. It's been an hour and a half. Great job. Thank you so much for your focus. Um, I will be here. So feel free to come up with your questions if you want. Everyone else, thank you so much.